Convergent evolution. Why is convergent evolution important? It's because of an argument from nested hierarchies. And I'm going to give you a few references. One from uh, University of California at Berkeley. Uh, one from Evolution Wiki and one from Tox Origins, all of which of course are um, evolutionary and atheist sites, and I think you will understand why um, uh, convergent evolution will turn out to be as important as it is. Uh, the Berkeley um, site starts out nested hierarchies. Common ancestry is conspicuous. Evolution predicts that living things will be related to one another in what scientists refer to as nested hierarchies, rather like nested boxes. Groups of related organisms share suites of similar characteristics, and the number of shared traits increases with relatedness. This is indeed what we observe in the living world and in the fossil record, and these relationships can be illustrated as shown below. And uh, that's what was below. And you'll notice a tree... And you'll notice that this tree, this end of the tree corresponds to mammals, and this end of the tree corresponds to reptiles and birds. The crocodiles and birds are, in their view, more closely related than whales and chimpanzees. Well, at least in this illustration they are. Um, that will become important later, so keep that in mind. In this phylogeny, snakes and lizards share a large number of traits as they are most closely related, more closely related to one another than the other animals represented. The same can be said of crocodiles and birds, whales and camels, and humans and chimpanzees. However, at a more inclusive level, snakes, lizards, birds, and crocodiles, whales, camels, chimpanzees, and humans all share some common traits. For one thing, they all have a backbone, for example. Um, this is Evo Wiki, and you'll notice that it starts out by saying, a work in prog progress help if you can. So they're still working on their, you know, Wiki um, means that, they're, that anybody can add to it if you want to. Um, and their introduction starts out, nested hierarchy refers to the way taxonomic groups fit neatly and completely inside other taxonomic groups. For example, all bats, order Cheoptera, are mammals. None are, for example, birds or reptiles or insects. All mammals are vertebrates. Likewise, all whales, order Cetacea, are also mammals and are thus also vertebrates. While it might not seem that this arrangement is obvious and unavoidable, while it might seem that this arrangement is obvious and unavoidable, it is not. Taxonomic groups are defined by traits, and it should be possible to mix traits from multiple defined groups. An example from classical mythology is Pegasus, a creature with features defined as both mammal, produces milk like a horse, and bird, has feathers. Mammals and birds are both orders, so if Pegasus existed, it would be a violation of the nested hierarchy. Now, while we're reading this, I want you to be understanding what the thought is, but I want you to be thinking around the box. Does anything come to mind that kind of mixes different orders or different classes or different families? What? Platypus. Platypus. Yes. So we have, we have actually a counterexample that they're just not thinking about. Okay, in fact, we'll come back to that. Um, likewise, for satyrs, human torso, goat legs, jackalopes, rabbit body and an antelope head, and crocodiles, crocodile head and body of a duck. 
It is not always possible to define a nested hierarchy for any arbitrary selected, arbitrarily selected set of items that many creationists have used this as an out. And somehow when it came through, they actually had left in the, um, I think somebody had put the wrong, uh, uh, the wrong HTML code. And so it came out just flat like that. Uh, Camp Ashby, a critique of Douglas Theobald's 29 evidences for macroevolution, which is what we're going to look at next, by the way. Uh, part one, one true phylogenetic tree. For example, motor vehicles do not show conservation of traits to single taxonomic groups, no matter how you choose to define your taxonomy. Whether a car has air conditioning is completely independent of whether it has power steering, for example. Now I'm going to say more of this, that uh, all Toyotas don't come from the same plan, and all that you can't divide things by manufacturer, and in fact, you will find cup holders in Cadillacs, and you will find them in Toyota Camrys or Corollas. And that's an important part of design, that, that the designer can take something that is used somewhere else and use it over again. Pardon me? You think it went dead? Okay. I don't know what happened there, but uh, um, let's hope it continues um, to function now. In any, in, in any case, um, you see, cars can use something in a line that, where you don't expect it. Okay. Life, however, shows a clear nested hierarchy, at least with regards to multicellular organisms. Ooh, bacteria don't have a clear nested hierarchy. All animals that produce milk, mammals, all will also have hair, have four limbs, be endothermic, warm-blooded, plus possess many other characteristics. Why should this be? Why do no other animals or plants produce milk? Why do no mammals have four limbs plus a pair of wings, like the pegasus or angels? This fits easily with the idea of common descent, but is not what would be expected from special creation. Although it isn't completely at odds with creation either, as the creators could con create life in any configuration imaginable. So notice their confession here right now is that it is not a coercive argument. It is merely a persuasive one. Look, nature is just the way we thought it would be. Uh, and you didn't really have any particular reason to predict that nature would be the way it is. Evolution in the nested hierarchy, the most obvious and simplest explanation for the observed nested hierarchy of taxonomic categories is evolution. In fact, a nested hierarchy is the almost inevitable result, why almost, of descent with modification if no transfer of traits between branches of descent is possible. See also gene transfer. So horizontal gene transfer messes up something here. Uh, twin nested hi uh, hierarchies. Two, the two possible hierarchies, one formed by comparing morphology, the physical appearance of the organisms, and the other formed by comparing molecular data, genotype of the organisms, would be expected to be congruent if all life had originated via evolution from a common ancestor. Well, there are certainly discrepancies between the two nested hierarchies. Notice the frank admission that this isn't really perfect. The two trees certainly show an amazing degree of similarity. So our question is, how much similarity is required before it stops being amazing, or before it stops being evolution, uh, evidence for a strict evolutionary tree? Of course, based upon the fact that the genes of an organism determines the morphology that I took the right, uh, that right, the genes determines is not agreeing in case, but that's, that's theirs. The morphology of the organism, one might expect the two trees would share a certain degree of resemblance. However, the biochemical analysis can also look at things that have very little or no influence on morphology, such as non-functional DNA or the sequence of metabolic enzymes, and end up with the same results. 
Also, there is no reason to assume that similar morphology demands similar genetics, as convergent evolutions of marsupials and eutherian mammals will attest. But that is saying that the forms can be the same when the genealogy is completely different, right? I thought we were talking about nested hierarchy. Well, apparently, you can't really do it on the basis of forms completely. Creatures such as the marsupial mouse and the eutherian mouse look very similar. Eutherian simply means true beast in, in Greek, and, uh, and it's basically talking about uh, mammals that have placentas rather than having a pouch like the marsupials. Um, they look very similar, but they differ a great deal in their genetics and biochemistry. This is because there are many ways for DNA to encode for the same proteins or the same regulatory elements, thus resulting in this, thus resulting the same morphology with different genetics. I'm sure there's a, that should have a with there, or in. Um, therefore, while common design would not predict such congruence between trees, common descent would. Thus, common descent is greatly corroborated by such congruence. Yeah, that's arguing a little much. Now, if, if there were no such thing as convergence, I would agree with them. But if you have convergence, that kind of messes things up, doesn't it? And now for the talk origins one, prediction number uh, 1.2, a nested hierarchy of species. As seen from the phylogeny in figure one, where I'm going to skip that, the predicted pattern of organisms at any given point in time can be described as groups within groups, otherwise known as a nested hierarchy. The only known processes that specifically generate unique nested hierarchical patterns are branching evolutionary processes. Uh, I think design could. Um, common descent is a genetic process in which the state of the present generation individual is dependent only upon genetic changes that have occurred since the most recent ancestral population or individual. Therefore, gradual, gradual evolution from common ancestors must, conf must conform to the mathematics of Markov processes and Markov chains. Using Markovian mathematics, it can be rigorously proven that branching Markovian replicating systems produce nested hierarchies, which means if you don't have a nested hierarchy, it isn't a Markovian process, and it isn't a standard evolutionary process. Mathematically proven. Remember, uh, any theorem cuts two ways. P always gives Q means not Q gives not P. For these reasons, biologists routinely use branching Markov chains to effectively model evolutionary processes, including complex genetic processes, the temporal distributions of surnames in populations, and the behavior of pathogens in ep epidemics. The nested hierarchical organization of species contrasts sharply with other possible biological, biological patterns, such as the continuum of the great chain of being and the continuum predicted by Lamarck's theory of organic progression. And he cites, of course, Darwin um, and uh, Futuma. Mere similarity between organisms is not enough to support macroevolution. The nested classification pattern produced by a branching evolutionary process, such as common descent, is much more specific than simple similarity. It's got to be this branching process. We see the branching process, therefore evolution. Well, therefore, probably evolution. It is an abductive argument. Notice they don't like our using those, but they're happy to use it on their own. Real-world examples that cannot be objectively classified in nested hierarchies are the elementary particles, which are described by quantum chromodynamics, the elements, whose organization is described by quantum mechanics and illustrated by the periodic table, the planets in the solar system, books in a library are specially designed for uh, objects like buildings, furniture, cars, etc. The point is, for many of these things, a grid is more 
uh, is better than a branch. Uh, even though you can turn a branching, uh, uh, pardon me, a grid into a branching hierarchy by simply assigning one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, parts of the grid as the primary one, and then using the other one as the secondary, you have now a branching hierarchy. Although it is trivial to classify anything subjectively in a hierarchical manner, so uh, you can do this on things that really aren't hi branching hierarchies. The only certain, only certain things can be classified objectively in a consistent, unique, nested hierarchy. The difference drawn here between subjective and objective is crucial and requires some elaboration and is best illustrated by example. Different models of cars certainly could be classified hierarchically. They could. Perhaps one could classify cars first by color, then within each color by number of wheels, then within each wheel by number by manufacturer, or perhaps start with the manufacturer and then the wheels and then the color. However, another individual may classify the same cars first by manufacturer, then by size, then by year, then by color, etc. This particular classification scheme chosen for cars is subjective. In contrast, human languages, which have common ancestors and are derived by descent with modification, generally can be classified in objective nested hierarchies. Anybody think of an, ex an exception to that? I can think of two. I don't know where Klingon belongs in the tree, and I don't know where Esperanto belongs in the tree. And in fact, English is a hodgepodge. It's, I guess, technically more Germanic than anything else, but it has a whole lot of French thrown in. It has a whole lot of uh, Celtic or Celtic thrown in. So, uh, while in general they're right, if you're going to be really specific, they're not right. And finally, I'll point out that they claim that language is natural. I would think that at least some language could be intelligently designed. Um, yeah, well, some things happen without people thinking about them, and you see standard linguistic shifts, for example, where in many languages T will go to TH, and uh, that's true for Hebrew, and it's true for Spanish. And it's even true for English if you, uh, if you go back to the original Greek in many things. In fact, there's a whole standard set of linguistic shifts that happen between uh, uh, Greek and English. Nobody would reasonably argue that Spanish should be categorized with German instead of with Portuguese. I'd agree with that. But it isn't quite as clear cut as they're making it out. Anyway. That's whenever you read this kind of anything, including what I say, you should be thinking beyond what somebody is saying to saying, is that really true? Is that generalization accurate? Interestingly, Linnaeus, who originally discovered the objective hierarchical classification of living organisms, also tried to classify rocks and minerals hierarchically. However, his classification for non-living uh, uh, objects eventually failed as it was found to be very subjective. Hierarchical classifications for inanimate objects don't work for the very reason that unlike organisms, rocks and minerals do not evolve by descent with modification from common ancestors. Or perhaps they're not quite as exquisitely designed. And design forces us into certain kinds of hierarchical classifications but not completely, and that's what we're going to find out. The degree to which a given phylogeny displays a unique, well-supported objective nested hierarchy can be rigorously quantified. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. Several different statistical tests have been developed for determining whether a phylogeny has a subjective or objective nested hierarchy, 
or whether a given nested hierarchy could have been generated by a chance process instead of a genealogical process. Now, what does that differentiate the genealogical process from? Does it differentiate it from design? Or does it only differentiate it from chance? Notice that this whole thing is discussing basically design versus nested hierarchy. And now the, uh, the opposition is between chance and nested hierarchy as if design happened by chance. Yes, uh, Ariel. Summarily uh, dismissed minerals as not being hierarchical. The, 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 man, you have the silicates, you got the uh, oxides and so on and so on. I can make all kinds of hierarchies with minerals. Why does he say it? It, it? He just dismissed it. Well, I think what he's trying to say is that there are so many different ways you could classify them. Okay. Well, we're going we're gonna to have some fun with that one in a little bit. These tests measure the degree uh, of cladistic hierarchical structure, also known as phylogenetic signal, in a phylogeny. And phylogeny is based upon true generalized, uh, pardon, true geneal genealogical processes give high values of hierarchical structure, whereas subjective phylogenies that have only apparent hierarchical structure, like a phylogeny of cars, for example, give low values. I, I can just conceive of somebody who was doing exquisite design where it in fact did follow a branching hierarchy. I don't think that this differentiates between design. I think it only differentiates between chance and common ancestry. Notice how that has subtly been missed. These tests, let's uh, see, yes. Therefore, since common descent is a genealogical process, common descent should produce organisms that can be organized into objective nested hierarchies. Equivalently, we predict that in general. Uh, why in general? Because they know there are some exceptions. Remember, the mathematics for this said you can prove that it always works. Right? But now they're backing off on that a little bit. And we're going to find out why in a little bit. In general, cladistic analysis of organisms should produce phylogenies that have large, statistically significant values of hierarchical structure. In standard scientific practice, they result with high statistical significance. Again, that's comparing it with chance, not with design is a result that has a 1% probability of less are occurring by chance. As a representation of universal common descent, the universal tree of life should have very high, very significant hierarchical structure and phylogenetic signal. Well, except for the bacteria. Right? Confirmation. Most existing species can be organized rather easily in a nested hierarchical classification. This is evident in the use of the Linnaean classification scheme. Based on shared derived characters, closely related organisms can be placed in one group, such as a genus. Several genera can be grouped in, together in one family. Several families can, produce, can be grouped together in an order, etc. Potential falsification. It would be very problematic if many species... How many is many? If many species were found that combine characteristics of different nested groupings. Proceeding with the previous example, some non-vascular plants could have seeds or flowers. Some? Now see here, they're going to say none, so they don't say many. Like vascular plants, but they do not. Gymnosperms, for example, conifers or pines, occasionally could be, produ could be found with flowers, but they never are. Non-seed plants, like ferns, could be found with woody stems. However, only some angiosperms have woody stems.
So non-seed plants could be found with woody stems. So why are we paying attention to woody stems? Obviously, you can get woody stems in, in ferns. Uh, you can get them in gymnosperms. You don't have to have them in angiosperms. So wood is one of those things that goes crosswise, right? It's one of those things that doesn't really fit in with the hierarchical classification. Conceivably, some birds could have mammary glands or hair. Some mammals could have feathers. They are an excellent means of insulation. Certain fish or amphibians could have differentiated or cusped teeth. But these are only characteristic of mammals. A mix and match of characters like this would make it extremely difficult to objectively organize species into nested hierarchies. Unlike organisms, cars do have a mix and match of characters, and this is precisely why a nested hierarchy does not flow naturally from classification of cars. So we're going to be looking for cup holders in our Corollas. Some have argued that if there were a designer, he or she would be expected to reuse successful de designs. That, that, by the way, this is my own comment now. Much like airliners might have light switches similar to those in houses. And because we don't see, why, why does the creator start all over again and reinvent the wheel when he had a perfectly good something over here? Um, and they will use this as an argument for they're not really being a creator because any sensible creator would have, you know, just used the same parts he had before. The alleged fact that we do not see that is, is used, this is used as evidence against design. And so we're going to look at convergent evolution. That is, we're going to look for cup holders in Corollas. Kangaroo genes close to humans and it's um, something I got from Reuters, but there's actually a, a, uh, uh, a scientific article behind it. Australia's kangaroos are genetically similar to humans and may have first evolved in China, Australian researchers said Tuesday. Scientists said that they had for the first time mapped the genetic code of the Australian marsupials and found much of it was similar to the genome for humans. Wow. There are a few differences, and we have a few more of this, a few less of that, but they are the same genes, and a lot of them are in the same order. Now, I want you to notice the evolutionary expectation. We thought they'd be completely scrambled, but they're not. There, there is great chunks. Don't ask me how they did that. There is great chunks of the human genome which is sitting right there in the kangaroo genome, Graves said, according to AAP. Humans and kangaroos last shared an ancestor at least 150 million years ago, the researchers found, where while mice and humans diverged from one another only 70 million years ago, and the implication is that the kangaroo genes are more in line with humans than, than the mouse genes. Yeah. We are seeing something that doesn't look quite like a nested hierarchy, does it? Kangaroos first evolved in China but migrated across the Americas to Australia and Antarctica. That's an interesting theory. Have you run into kangaroo migration before? New genetic, uh, we're going to talk about sharks now. New genetic research finds shark, human protein, stunningly similar. And this one is from Science Daily. Again, there's a science article behind it. Despite widespread fascination with sharks, the world's oldest predators have long been a genetic mystery. The first deep dive into a great white shark's genetic code has fished up big surprises behind a design so effective that it's barely changed since before dinosaurs roamed. Cornell researchers have discovered that many of the endangered great white sharks, sharks' proteins involved in an array of different functions, including metabolism, match humans more closely than they do zebrafish, the, uh, zebrafish, the quintessential fish model. And notice that zebrafish are supposed to be more closely related to us because the sharks branched off first and then the zebrafish and humans branched off from each other later. Skipping a paragraph there. 
We were very surprised to find that for many categories of proteins, sharks showed more similarities with humans and zebrafish, Stanhope said. Although sharks and bony fishes are not closely related, they are nonetheless both fish. That dot, dot, dot is theirs, not mine. That's why I left it in white. While mammals have very different anatomies and physiologies, Nevertheless, our findings open the possibility that some aspects of white shark metabolism, as well as other aspects of its overall biochemistry, might be more similar to that of a mammal than to that of a bony fish. We are seeing cup holders in our Toyota Corollas. Of particular interest was that the white shark had a closer match to humans for proteins involved in metabolism. Uh, about birds. Birds evolved ultraviolet vision several times. Science Daily. Ultraviolet vision evolved at least eight times in birds from a common violet sensitive ancestor, finds a study published in Biomed Central's open access journal BMC Evolutionary Biology. All of these are due to single nucleotide changes in the DNA. Modern daylight, daytime birds either have violet sensitive or ultraviolet sensitive vision. Being ultraviolet sensitive alters visual cues used in selecting a mate, avoiding predators, and finding food. Research is from Uppsala University and the Swedish Academy of Agricultural Scientists sequence the genes responsible for producing the light sensitive pigment, SWS1 opsin, from 40 species of birds in 29 families. Generating a phylogenetic tree from these sequences shows that there have been at least 14 shifts between violet and ultraviolet sensor sensitive color vision and back. An ancestor of passeriforms, or perching barks, which includes lark swallows, back birds, finches, birds of paradise, and crows, and psittacoformes, uh, parrots and allies, changed from the ancestral violet sensitive color vision to the ultraviolet and in some cases, passerines have reverted back to violet vision. These are finding cup holders in all kinds of different... Uh, now, well, to be honest, this one isn't quite as strong as some of the other ones because it only takes one mutation to do it. But th this seems to uh, run contrary to uh, at least the uh, Myron uh, Salvini Palwan's explanation that uh, the eyes of animals must have evolved independently at least 65 times. Well, no, I, it, it, it's, it's perfectly consistent. What it says is that that whole principle is there all the time. Evolution can make things come and can make things go, and who knows? Uh, but this challenges the basic evolutionary process or suggestion that uh, the reasons eyes evolved is because they had survival value all the way along. Yes. Well, what happened was, you see, what you have to understand is that eventually the survival value doesn't happen anymore for violet versus ultraviolet vision. And when it doesn't happen anymore, the violet vision is better and so it switches back. So it just depends on where the bird happens to live, what it happens to need. And uh, you see the same <clears throat> thing happens in fish who evolve eyes. And then when they no longer need them, they devolve the eyes. And then when they need them again, they re-evolve the eyes. This is very convenient for evolution. It is rather convenient, isn't it? But it does sort of destroy the argument from nested hierarchy. Anders Odin and Ola Hastad, I'm butchering that I'm sure, who performed this research commented, there are two different amino acid alterations that can each change bird color vision from violet to ultraviolet. One particular single nucleotide change has occurred at least 11 separate times. In general, during evolution, once a color shift has occurred, all the species of this ancestor keep it, meaning that the rest of the eye and Physiology must also evolve to cement, must also evolved, why somebody needs to edit the English there, to cement in the new color sensitivity. But 
But then sometimes it loses it. So obviously it doesn't evolve to cement it in or, or it wouldn't lose it. If you're confused, that's okay. <laughs> okay, what about brains in birds and mammals? During the Mesozoic, 250 million to 65 million years ago, by the way, this is an abstract of a paper in science, two distinctly related groups of reptiles, the synodont or mammal-like reptiles and the Colossarian theropod dinosaurs, gave rise to mammals and birds respectively. Both mammals and birds evolved brains some 10 times as large relative to a given body weight as, do, as those of their ancestors. In both groups, these brains contributed to the evolution of the ability to control body temperature, endothermy, and complex social interactions, including parental care and a reliance on learning that even involves tool use. The brain evolved twice. The size of most parts of the brain increased in birds and mammals, but the cerebral hemispheres and cerebellum, both of which are involved in sensory and motor integration, underwent particularly spectacular development. Although mammals and birds evolved from distantly related groups of reptiles, the high, higher integrative centers and circuitry of their cerebral hemispheres are very similar. And comparative neurobiologists continue to vigorously debate whether these centers evolved from the same ancestral neural centers or from different ones. That's because they don't know where they came from. They just are. Now, this is uh, an example of somebody putting a computer system into a Cadillac and somebody else putting a computer system into a Lexus. Now, do you classify them by the brains? Or do you classify them by the other characteristics of the car? It seems we have a problem here. Speculation about the evolutionary steps leading to large and complex mammalian and avian brains is equally contentious and unresolved, in part because of the rarity of the fossil skulls, and until recently the need to destroy such skulls, in order to expose the endocasts, uh, that's the casts that are molded by the cranial cavity. Typically, endocasts are the only record of the brain's outward appearance in a transition form because brains themselves are rarely fossilized. But the old way, you had to destroy the skull in order to get the endocast out. Now, what about dolphins and insects and hearing? Dolphin hearing system component found in insects. You're hearing correctly. A hearing system component thought to be unique in tooth whales like dolphins has been discovered in insects following research involving the University of Strathclyde, which I presume is in New Zealand. I should have looked it up. Scotland, is it? And then, then there's one, uh, uh, there's a couple of other people that were working with these people in uh, New Zealand, though. Uh, I know that because of more in the text. The research is challenging ideas about how, lar how large group of insects, including crickets and katydids here, revealing the unexpected similarity to toothed whale hearing. Scientists from the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Auckland, with colleagues from plant and food research in New Zealand, led the research with engineers from the University of Strathclyde working on the biochemical aspects of the project. They discovered that the iconic New Zealand insect, the Weta, rely on a unique limit, uh, lipid. Again, that's an interesting grammar there. A compound that includes oils and fats to hear the world around them. Dr. James Windmill of the University of Strathclyde Center for Ultrasonic Engineering said, and I'm going to skip the first paragraph because it's not that interesting for what we're talking about. The discovery is interesting as previously only toothed whales were known to use this hearing system component, the lipid. There are many similarities in the use of lipids to amplify sounds and help both animal groups to hear. 
We don't know why animals who are so far apart in evolutionary terms have this similarity, but it opens up the possibility that others may use the same system component. The sound is known to be transmitted through a liquid-filled cavity to reach the hearing organs, but until the current research was carried out, it was presumed that the liquid was simply the insect equivalent of blood. The research has found that it was in fact a lipid of a new chemical class. Uh, it's actually not quite the same as the dolphin's lipid, but it's used in the same way. They believe the role of the lipid is to efficiently transmit sound between compartments of the ear and perhaps to amplify quiet sounds. The researchers carried out their work with the Auckland tree weta. They believe that the same method of hearing is likely to be used by other members of its biologic class, including crickets and katydids, which are famous for the sounds they produce. So it's probably true for more than just the weta. It's just that this is the first animal that has actually been researched to find it. Now, another example, mollusk brains. Brainy mollusks evolve nervous systems four times. So do you classify by nervous system or do you classify by something else? Um, slimy and often sluggish they may be, but some mollusks deserve credit for their brains, which it now appears they managed to evolve independently four times. The mollusk family includes the most intelligent invertebrates on the planet, octopuses, squid, and cuttlefish. Now the latest and most sophisticated genetic analysis of their evolutionary history overturns our previous understanding of how they got so brainy. The new findings expand a growing body of evidence that in very different groups of animals, mollusks and mammals, for example, for instance, central nervous systems evolved not once but several times in parallel. Remember, we already talked about birds and and um, mammals. Kevin Cossat uh, of Auburn University, Alabama and his colleagues are responsible for the new evolutionary history of the mollusk family, which includes 100,000 living species in eight lineages. They analyzed genetic sequences common to all mollusks and looked for differences that have accumulated over time. The more shared sequence difference between two species, the less related they are, which is kind of a standard story. The findings on which they re uh, on which rely on advanced statistical analyses fundamentally rearrange branches on the mollusk family tree. Who knew? In the traditional tree, snails and slugs, gastropods, are most closely related to octopuses, squid, and cuttlefishes and nautiluses, cephalospods, which appear to make sense in terms of their nervous system. Both groups have highly centralized nervous system compared with other mollusks and invertebrates. Now, I want you to notice this. In the old classification, they were all together. But that's not really objective. Snails and slugs have clusters of ganglia, bundles of nerve cells, which in many species are fused into a single organ. Cephalopods have highly developed central nervous systems that enable them to navigate a maze, use tools, mimic other species, learn from each other, and solve complex problems. Slimy cousin, but in Kosot's new family tree. So that old one that you heard about that classified them all with their brains together, that's not really true. That's not objective. This is the real objective one. Um, snails and slugs sit ne uh, next to clams, oysters, mussels, and scallops, bivalves, which have much simpler nervous systems. The new genetic tree also places cephalopods on one of the earliest branches, meaning they evolved before snails, slugs, clams, or oysters. All this means that gastropods and cephalopods are not as closely related as once thought, so they must have evolved their centralized nervous systems independently at different times. We've got 357 Hamies in um, Dodge and in Chevrolet and in Ford. That's a remarkable evolutionary feat. Traditionally, most neuroscientists and biologists think complex structures evolved, usually evolve only once. Notice, they're surprised. This shouldn't happen. Yes, uh, Ariel. Well, I, I, I would raise this question here that uh, uh, 
did it evolve once. Quantitatively, in a few hundred million years, you're not going to be able to evolve one of these in terms of the complex genetic changes you have to have. They're, they're totally yes. ignoring this picture. Which is precisely why they thought it only evolved once, because they couldn't see how it would have evolved once. They said, well, maybe we were lucky once. But getting lucky four times in a row, give me a break. <laughs> we found that the evolution of the complex brain does not happen in a linear progression. Parallel evolution can achieve similar levels of complexity in different groups. I calculated it happened at least four times. Boy. The four groups that independently revolve centralized nervous systems include the octopus and, of course, cuttlefish and so. A freshwater snail genus called Helisoma tritonia, a genus of strikingly colored sea slugs, and Dola, fibra, Dola brifera, another genus of sea slugs, albeit less aesthetically interesting. If these results hold up, it suggests strongly that centralized nervous systems evolve more than once in mollusca. This is Paul Katz, a neurobiologist at Norma, uh, Georgia State University in Atlanta. This is more evidence that you can get completely uh, complexity emerging multiple times. Now the question is, is it more evidence that you can get it without some kind of a designer? Maybe not. And the general references to nature, um, in case you want to look at it. <coughs> um, convergent evolution in general. There is actually a website called mapoflife.org. And it's entitled the Map of Life Con Convergent Evolution Online. And it talks about love darts, which are little things with pe uh, that snails and... Um, earthworms and a couple, one other thing stick each other with uh, before they have sex with each other. Don't ask me. <laughs> Camera eyes and jellyfish. Placentas and skinks and fish. Gliding. These are just the ones that are advertised on the first page. Agriculture and ants. And one of the more remarkable ones, Dev Deadly Sea Snake, has a doppelganger. This one I didn't get from that website. Um, scientists have discovered that the lethal beaked sea snake is actually two species with separate evolutions, which resulted in identical snakes. Identical enough so that they thought they were the same species before. This is Honda's answer to the Toyota Camry that looks identical except for the nameplate in the front. The University of Queensland's associate professor Brian Fry said the Australian Asian beaked snakes were originally thought to be from the same species. However, in comparing their DNA, the research team had found that these two snakes were unrelated. This was so good that they couldn't even tell the difference until they got into the DNA. This mix-up could have been medically catastrophic since the CSL sea snake antivenom is made using the venom from the Asian snake based on the assumption that it was the same species, Associate Professor Fry said. Well, actually, not quite. Luckily, the antivenom is not uh, only very effective against the Australian new species, but actually against all sea snakes since they all share a very streamlined fish-specific venom. They not only look the same, but they had the same poison in terms of its effect and in terms of its antigenicity so that you could prevent, produce an antivenom. But different DNA. But different DNA. Associate Professor Fry said the finding was an example of a situation where two species evolved separately but ended up looking similar, known as the convergent phenotypic evolution phenomenon. Associate Professor Fry said that the beaked morphology of the species could be associated with the extremely specialized niche the snakes occupy, even though both species evolved from different ancestors and were not even close relatives. 
He said the two species evolved the same specialized habit of silt fi uh, habitat of silt-filled shadow shallows of tropical estuaries throughout the Asian and Australian regions. Uh, skipping over a paragraph, the Asian snake will retain the original name in Hydrina schistosa. <laughs> Australian beak snake, a sea snake, has been given the scientific name, and they're leaving in Hydrina there because they don't know what they're going to call it, but they're going to call it something else. Zoophilae, which, which identifies the region in New Guinea where it is found. The new snake will be placed in a separate genus to the true Enhydrina genus in a follow-up publication that will resolve the complex higher-order relationship of sea snakes. Complex, high, uh, complex higher-order relation. That doesn't sound like a neat nested hierarchy, does it? <coughs> the same protein... Oh, by the way, remember that the morphologic um, uh, hierarchy is the same as the, uh, the genetic hierarchy? Well, not quite. Now, of course, there is, we've talked about earlier in other Sabbath schools, the same protein in bats and toothed whales for hearing. The platypus, which not only looks like it's a mix, but turns out that genetically it looks like it's a mix, doesn't really fit into the standard hierarchy. I mean, you can create something for it and call it special, but, you know, there are similarities to birds, similarities to mammals, similarities to reptiles. And then, of course, there's the whole question of horizontal gene transfer. Everywhere you see horizontal gene transfer, that is seeing cup holders everywhere. Right? Because what's happening is that a gene from one organism is now moved lock, stock, and barrel to another organism while the two organisms are completely unrelated. Well, almost completely unrelated. But how, how easy is it to move a, a gene from a human being to an apple tree? I don't know. <laughs> you know, those you Australian aborigines are doing strange things with, um, with um, kangaroos, I guess. What? Genetic modification. Yeah. Well, remember, what is the difference between horizontal gene transfer and, uh, shall we call it, assisted horizontal gene transfer? No. Horizontal gene transfer occurs very commonly in bacteria, but we're dealing with a whole different but, group here. But if you find a blue rose that has the coloration from, let's say, a violet, was that horizontal gene transfer, or was that assisted horizontal gene transfer? And how would you know? Well, how about, how about a yeast that produces human insulin? When uh, one uses a hierarchy, different traits make for different trees. That means that we don't have quite as neat a nested hierarchy. There are enough exceptions to prove the rule. Prove meaning in the old English sense of test the rule. Now, my take is that the argument for Darwinian evolution produces a nested hierarchy. That the argument that Darwinian evolution produces a nested hierarchy, that a nested hierarchy is what we see, and therefore evolution is the best explanation for life, never was coercive. You'll notice that they admitted that at the beginning. It could be persuasive if like, life were really like that. But with multiple examples of surprising, amazing, convergent evolution and horizontal gene transfer, I don't think it's even persuasive. <clears throat> I think the problem is these people are looking at uh, life through evolutionary eyes. The filter has taken out all of the, all of the <coughs> contrary stuff, and now when they look at it, it looks good. But when you look at all the stuff that's been filtered out, it isn't really that good. But... That's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Uh, Paul, I, yes. I would just add the comment uh, that it seems to me, looking at it, looking at the total picture here, especially all these examples you have here of this, uh, uh, these uh, parallel evolution or convergent evolution, 
the convergent evolution argument to me is more persuasive of design than it is of evolution. If you look yeah. at both possibilities, uh, it's, these things are too complex to have evolved independently. Well, in one sense, you could say it's not, it's not really a knockdown argument in that. If the environment requires something, then, for example, the streamlined shape of porpoises is not that much different from the streamlined shape of, shape of sharks. You know? Um, uh, one has horizontal fluke at the end and the other one has vertical fin at the end. But other than that, I mean, you know, the, the, the general shape fits and it makes sense <laughs> from a mechanical point of view. Um, and either survival of the fittest or I if it had the power to do that <coughs> or, um, or design could account for that shape. The problem that, uh, that I see with that kind of argument is how do we know what it takes to make something that smooth and, 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 uh, and you know, streamlined and so forth? And can you really do it? Well, now, for a shape, you can kind of imagine it a little easier. But for brains, that is so complex that it's hard to see how natural selection can do it in the first place. And now to be told that it happens three or four times, whenever you need an eye, it <coughs> pops up. You know, something is wrong with this. The, the, the classic example of a convergent evolution is, is the, uh, the eye of the squid and the eye of the vertebrate, which are, you know, deuterus stones, protostones, two separate and turn evolved groups right. uh, producing an anatomically similar eye. Uh, seems to me that uh, this is too complex to say, hey, uh, these both in evolved independently. I, I agree, and I, I think that our argument is far more powerful than theirs. I think yeah. theirs is to me, that's really that's weak, if not non-existent. But the, the chances of evolving these complex things is so rare. This is a case for creation. Yeah. We have a comment back here, uh, and then I think I had one here as well. I Go think ahead. this is an argument of total desperation. Uh, it seems to me like this kind of implying, well, the evidence has grown so strong against evolution and appears to be designed that we have to prove that evolution occurred dozens of times, or whatever. And so it has to be right. You know, we can't explain how it could, could occur the first time. I, I mean, they're just arguing in circles, and I mean, circles within circles within circles and overlapping circles. It's ludicrous. You, you, agree, you can certainly I make that it argument. It looks like design. Yeah, I, I, think that, I think that that's a rational argument. I have a question, and, and at the beginning of the presentation, you talked about non-functional DNA. Is there such a thing? Um, Can you explain that? If... Well, actually, technically, I think we can safely say in rare cases, yes. <coughs> uh, or is it just in reserve for an ad adaptation at a future date the, that God implanted a spare tire? Mm -hmm. Well, let me give you an example. In some cases of G6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, there are mutations that completely wipe out the function of G6-phosphate dehydrogenase in human red cells, and presumably elsewhere in the human body as well. Um, when that happens, malaria organisms don't thrive very well in the red cells. Now, the red cells are sensitive to lysis by eating things like fava beans in that case. So it's not really good in the total overall scheme of things. Humans are better off with that particular enzyme. If you have a, a group of people that lives in a highly malaria-related area, you will have now a totally non-functional 
G6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. It is conceivable that mm -hmm. some animals could have the same kind of thing, have a gene that is totally non-functional, no longer works, that used to work, and therefore is, um, if you want to call it that, vestigial. Yeah. You know, it's a little bit like having a car with a radio that's broken. The radio is non-functional. Or turned off. Well, turned off means that you can turn it on again, see. And that's, that could be functional. Just like a spare tire is actually functional, as, as you find out if you get a flat. But some things are just flat out no longer functional, even though they were originally designed. Now, how much of the genome is like that? I don't know. Um, what I can say is that at least 80% of the genome that has been checked out is transcribed and appears to be used. Evolutionists hate that. They want about 10% of the genome to be used because that's the stuff that's evolutionary conserved. The idea that something could be used without being evolutionarily conserved is, oh, I think they called it the evolution-free gospel of, um, of ENCODE or something like that, which is fascinating. What it says is that I will not see anything. You see, if humans have a brand new gene that does brand new stuff, but isn't related to anything that chimpanzees or gorillas or orangutans have, then it can't really be there because evolution requires a step-by-step -step process that gets better and better as you get further along. Or gets worse depending if you happen to be a cave fish. The problem is that they're trying to make a science out of something that A, is not necessarily scientific, and B, more importantly, doesn't fit real life. And as I've been surveying the, the arguments on this, I think I've come to the conclusion that a lot of times when people say, well, you don't understand evolution, the proper answer is to say, yes, I do. What you don't understand is that evolution doesn't fit real life. Well, I think we have a, an example here of the sociology of science, which is a two-edged sword. Creationists have the sociology also, you know. We need to be very careful of all this. And uh, we need to stay by the solid facts much more than we do. But uh, the intellectual matrix of evolution has permeated science so deeply and so long that it is very difficult for an evolutionist to recognize uh, the insidious influence he's under. Uh, it's in the vocabulary. Uh, terms like chemical evolution, or it's an uh, convergent evolution. Uh, that's assuming evolution right there. So you use those two words together. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you, don't, you don't analyze that carefully enough to say, hey, this is an oxymoron you've got here, convergent evolution, if you don't believe in evolution. Well, you're right. It, it, the, the first question is, how did evolution do this? Instead of asking the, the more fundamental question, did evolution do this? Exactly. Now, I will say one thing for creationist's sake uh, before we go too much further, and that is that I don't want anybody to leave here thinking that we have, with all of this stuff, disproved evolution. One can make an argument that we've made it tougher. 
But I don't think that we've gotten to the point where with this material here, we have disproved evolution. Um, and in fact, to the person who comes at it from an evolutionary background, we may not be able to disprove evolution at all. Um, all we can do is make them very uncomfortable, let them think about it for a while, and hopefully in the still of the night, and that happens sometimes, witness Dean Kenyon, they start saying, you know, this really doesn't make sense, and I ought to be thinking a, a little bit differently from this. Um, and that will particularly be true when A, they're more open, and B, uh, they, uh, they have something driving themselves to think well, maybe there is some kind of intelligence and maybe <coughs> I should be listening to it. But, but the, there is a limit to the number of nails you can put into a coffin. <laughs> but I think that this is an important one because what it does is I think it takes what they consider to be and what they will use as a strong argument for evolution and basically blunt its force to the point where they're now having to answer as many questions as we are, maybe a few more. Yes. Yep. My understanding in the, to the evolutionists I've talked to is this is the only way we can explain without a God how life came about. What intrigues me is how they go from chance to genealogical and then back and forth uh, in their operation. Uh, if well, we started out by chance, why, you know? Well, your, your little phrase there really answers the whole thing. The only way we can explain without a God. You see, and, and once you realize that that is the operative phrase that pulls them down a lot of these trails, then the arguments don't seem quite so strong anymore. Comment over here. Seems to me in order to get chance working, you gotta have so many helmets and things prepared for it. You have to have a, uh, what, what does it say, we're in the right place in the universe to, you have to be kind of a life zone before you can even expect chance to do something with it. So you've got to have something existing before chance can take place. And then once you get that something there, you've got to explain how that got there. And it just gets worse and worse. I don't see that this problem, chance is going to get any better no matter how you aim at it. You're not going to hit the target. But if you start by ruling out God, then this is the closest yeah. thing you can get. Had it, really. Um, I suppose that uh, we'll close now then. Um, for those of you who are interested, we will be talking about an argument for the existence of God uh, from causality uh, next week. And uh, I think I'll be ahead of the curve this time so that I'll give you uh, almost a week to be able to look up something if you want to. <laughs>